let's just start off from a place of, um, of doing a recap. Just in case someone who's in the room wasn't here last week, can we, can we start off from a place of doing a recap? It's all right, right? Just for a few minutes, okay. So I'm, I'm going to pose the question to Sfiso, right? Sfiso, if you can, um, and good evening to you. <laughs> can you please help us just to define what family tax is and help us to figure out where we landed last week because we had a concluding point in a sense. Just remind all of us where we landed and uh, what exactly is family tax as we're discussing about it. Good evening, Pastor Pev. Um, I see we continue where we left off last time, yeah? And I thought this time I was sitting very far away from you. But that's okay. And good evening to the church family. Um, Quite a lot of reds going on, so happy Valentine's Day as well. <laughs> right, we, just to recap on what we did, la, la, what we discussed uh, last week, um, we tried to define black tax uh, because we use the family tax term, but we, as we were discussing, we found that black tax was the term that kept propping up. You might not have said it, but we could tell from your facial expression that you were thinking it. So... <laughs> And we, we agreed that that was a narrow approach to it because I remember we used an example of the Philippines that they have a systemized way of collecting family tax. And, you know, there's so many examples across the world where if we were to use the term black tax, we would immediately leave out people of certain races, whereas that is the fact they go through the same phenomenon. We defined it, uh, the phenomenon of uh, family tax, as money paid by a family member towards the upkeep of family member or family members. So this was the money that they had to pay through their general upkeep, precisely because they are doing something good in their lives, that's upward mobility. So the assumption is that they have money. Okay, that was what we agreed on last week and we we did, right? We agreed on it. Oh, so everybody's looking at me as if, no, oh, that's not. <laughs> anyway, it'll come up from the question session that we'll have. Um, we, we also touched on the fact that much as um, it is called tax, it, uh, it covers more than just finances. It covers more than just money. It also goes into our emotions. It goes into our mental well-being, which is why the list is here tonight. Um, she's going to cover that part of uh, your, the mental uh, effect it has on you as a person. So no, Celeste is not here to fill up a gender quotient. No, she's coming to add an expert's opinion on certain things that trouble all of us because uh, family tax goes not just into emotions, mental, and also your spiritual well-being. So these are the things we, we spoke about last week. Um, we, we did agree that culture was used um, to guilt trip us into paying this. And we, we went and used, uh, we defined the word Ubuntu. Um, I like how I pronounced that. I, I sounded like somebody who's not African. Uh, Ubuntu, it's Ubuntu woman. <laughs> That's how. So we, we used Ubuntu as a, a, a center point where guilt tripping is used to say, if you don't do that, means you lost your Africanism. And we, we defined what it was. We said it was a, uh, collective socialism that was used back in the day. Um, as we conclude this, we'll realize why not, why we shouldn't allow Ubuntu to be used against you in terms of uh, guilt tripping you to, to pay family tax. We also discussed boundaries. Uh, if you remember, we said there should be boundaries strong. And again, Mzingai is going to go into that in a little bit of detail. You know, he's also valentined up for tonight. Everybody can see that. So the pressure is on to define everything about boundaries, budgeting, and the like. Um, we agreed that um, boundaries are an essential part in handling uh, family tax, a.k.a. black tax. Um, I, I actually mentioned a book in the process, and I said, here's a book that covers boundaries, but I wouldn't um, recommend it to anybody. Um, I wish I hadn't said that because... I got quite the tongue lashing afterwards. How can you really read a book and not let us read it? 
One of the main, look, tonight is not a book review, but um, one of the reasons I wouldn't um, recommend that book is that it's written by a South African author who takes the whole phenomenon and blames it squarely on apartheid. I have a little bit of a problem with that. Look, I'm not going to take anything from a, apartheid. It was, very, it was a very bad political system. It was atrocious. It was horrendous. It took away the dignity of other races. However, there's a danger involved when you start blaming things squarely on one phenomenon. You know where the danger is? We become victim mentality people. And from that perspective, you can never solve anything. That is why I have my reservations with that. I, I don't want to go too much into that, but I would advise you when somebody gives you and tells you, oh, this is because of um, apartheid, that's why we have black tax. Um, and then to justify the, uh, the rest of the continent because it didn't happen there. Oh, it was colonialism. Okay, fair enough. If you go to the United States, the African-Americans have the same phenomenon and they blame it on slavery, which is a little bit weird because Slavery was gone 1863, and then they had segregation there, which was more, it lasted longer than slavery, it was worse off. But they don't blame that. And here's the thing, I started thinking, hang on a minute, there used to be slaves right here in Eswatin, just about 150 years ago. Yeah, I know, I know you didn't know this part of your history. Maswat used to have slaves. I know this because my grandfather, he, he carried out quite a number of military excursions in Southern Africa. This is now 1870s. And he came back with spoils of war, which were cattle, women, children, and men. And in Saswati, we have words like tikkili, skrili. There's a reason why we have these names, because there were people who were slaves in our culture. It's nothing new. But the funny thing is those descendants of those slaves, they don't know they were slaves. So they live life happily and they have no worry in the world until you tell them that they're descendants of slaves. Then there's a problem. I won't mention, I, I fortunately know surnames that are actually of slave origin. Uh, and no, no, I'm not looking at you because you are. <laughs> So somebody's shaking their head. No, no, it's not because of that. So there was slavery, but you never hear those people because they don't know. And please don't come ask me after the show and say, who was it that's a slave? No, let's leave it at that. Okay, so this is what we discussed. Um, uh, we also, Pastor Bev, you asked a question, and what else was it we discussed? We, we had um, an interesting uh, question that was there. Um, oh, it's still there, up there. It says... Family tax, is it a burden or is it Ubuntu? So we, we had to answer that question, right, last week. Um, and the answer is, what is it? Is family tax a burden or is it Ubuntu? I think as we go through tonight, that's really going to come out. Yeah, yeah. because we don't know. It's going to come out. That's why he said that we don't know. Probably as we discuss, it's going to come out. But what it will be answered tonight is the new question, which is how do you have those crucial conversations? Because that's why everybody's here tonight. They want to learn that. And I'm not piling the pressure on you, Celeste, but that is what we're answering tonight. Thank you, Pastor Pep. Yeah, but before we get to that, um, as, you, as you're indicating, in as much as I'm coming to you, Celeste, um, because maybe I'm, I'm figuring out, let's go right around from one end to the other. So, um, we talked a bit about mental health issues um, last week, as Fiso has just brought up. Um, and I'm wondering, from your personal experience and also professional experiences, you work with a lot of people, how does family tax trigger mental health issues? Thank you so much, Bevan. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's a broad question. Mental health is large the same way your physical health is large, your spiritual health. But generally, it's, it's going to impact people the same way other problems impact people. So you'll have people struggling with depression, with anxiety. You have people committing suicide because of um, financial burdens, which can stem from family tax. And that's like the fatal the most critical thing that could happen with mental health, that they end up so depressed that they get suicidal. You get people who become substance abusers to try and cope with the pressure. So they drink alcohol, they take drugs. You may get people who are having sleepless nights, um, their appetite has been impacted. So holistically, the person will be impacted by the pressure, um, whether it's a burden, 
or not, which we'll soon find out, um, because of family tax. We need to keep in mind that family tax, although like we say it's more than money, majority of the time it's money. And so we've got to be looking at money. And when it comes to mental health, um, money will impact your thoughts, your feelings, your relationships, and your behavior. And so whether you have a lot or have a little, um, if your identity is not solid in Christ, your mental health is going to be impacted by that, if that makes sense. Um, I think one of the things I want to highlight when it comes to this question of mental health and family tax stroke money is that we're physical beings having a spiritual experience, right? And so we need to do things within our true identity, which is spiritual. And so that means even how we spend, use, think of, relate to our money, we need to think of it from that point, right? Because that's its natural purposes for, from God. Anything in life, whether it's money, whether it's food, whether it's the gym, if we are not using stuff for its natural purpose or the purpose God intended for it to be, you're going to have mental health issues. And I use the analogy of a pen. A pen is not to clean your ear or stir your tea because you're going to have problems. You're going to end up with ink in your tea and your pen's not going to work. Or to bite at the back and suck. You'll end up with ink in your mouth. I learned that the hard way. Because a pen's not to be sucked on. It's not a lollipop or ice cream. Right? So it's the same thing with money. If I am not using the money the way I'm meant to be using it according to how God has instructed. And if you don't know how, Pastor Kevin preached on Sunday. So if you don't know, it means you weren't in church or you weren't following on the um, online. But go back, it's there, right? He tells you the when, the how, and the why. Um, but that's, that's the crux of it for me. So family tax, yes, is it a burden or is it a boon? So I think it depends on what you're doing under the instruction of the Lord in your relationship to money as well as to people, right? So at the, the end of the day, it's the purpose of the money. It's submitting it to Jesus because it's not our money. And then also it's been recognizing the boundary and when to say yes, when to say no, how much, how long, which is the stuff that we'll be talking about later. So definitely I think it's, it's imperative that we realize that um, family tax can be a burden, a serious burden, um, a burden to the point that if somebody is depressed suicidal, they can take their life. And a lot of the time, we may have heard of people committing suicide because of financial pressure, but we may not know where that pressure came from. We may start judging and saying, well, they didn't manage their finances well. No, we don't really know that. Um, I'm not saying it is family tax, but it could be that that is what the end result is. And separate from just the mental health issues, because I don't believe we can separate mental health from physical health, you then may end up with high blood pressure. You may end up with heart issues. So again, it can be quite fatal if the burden is so high and we are not using money for the purpose God intended for it to be used for you, if that makes sense. Thanks, That's Bevan. Good. That's good. Thanks for sharing. Now, you're talking about um, financial burdens, right? And one thing that comes to mind um, is the issue with debts, right? And many people really struggle with debts. And I, I want us to connect this issue of um, the burden of debts and family tax. So I, I want to pose a question to you, Mzingai, in line with, uh, with debts. And I want to ask, how can, how can we all avoid family tax-influenced debts? Thank you, um, Pastor Bevin, and a very good evening to um, all of us here, and happy Valentine's. <laughs> so that's a very interesting question. Um, I've, I've been told before that when someone starts by saying it's a very interesting question, they don't know how to answer. <laughs> um, debt is a reality, and many of the times it ends up taking you know, us down, you know, the mental health lane, um, so to speak. So it's important, as I think we would um, realize later on as we speak to uh, the issues of having crucial conversations, it's important that we become real with ourselves. Uh, we come, become real with our, our capabilities, uh, what we can and what we cannot do when it comes to finances. It's important that our spending decisions are based on our earning capacity. If we do not know how, we, how much we earn, 
we cannot begin to spend. It's important that we align our spending with how much we are earning or how much we are making so that we don't find ourselves spending what we do not have. And when we spend what we do not have, literally it means we are using borrowed uh, money. We have automatically um, gone out of what we, we have earned. We are now borrowing and that's debt. And that's a very dangerous um, a space to be in if you do not know how you are going to service the debt because uh, debt you will usually come with interest in most of the cases. It is not just coming as the capital amount that must be paid back. It would usually come with some interest that must be paid. So if we have not made an assessment of how much shortfall we are dealing with for what we want to spend on and how much it will cost us the cost of capital to pay back the money, we are in a very, very serious danger of being in a, a, a debt that perhaps we may not be able to come out of in a short space of time. And if we are in that situation, we are most likely to be uh, visitors to micro lenders uh, and every other lender uh, where we may not easily come out. And that's very dangerous. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking from something you spoke about last week, because you talked a bit about um, boundaries and you also passed through the idea of having a budget. How, how do those two things connect? Um, budgeting and establishing boundaries. Thank you. So the starting point about boundaries is it's important to appreciate, I think Pastor Kevin spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, are we peacemakers or are we peacekeepers? Now, this basically means we've got to be real again with ourselves. We can't afford to be peacekeepers on a matter that can take us six feet under. We have got to allow ourselves to be peacemakers by being truthful with ourselves, speaking out on what we can and what we cannot do. That's from a financial perspective. Now, speaking out about what we can and we cannot do means we have made an assessment of how much we have, how much is on the table and how much is not there. And we know how much then must be spent. So budgeting then becomes an extremely important aspect. It becomes an animal or an elephant in the room that must be spoken to, that must be identified, and that must... Uh, that we must all relate to. It shouldn't be an elephant that we can't talk about. It's money. Uh, we, it, it, it's, it's, we don't know how debt, uh, you know, how our father ends. We don't want to ask, even ask him. Uh, we just know he ends and, you know, it ends there. We need to know how much is end and we need to then know how much then gets spent. So it becomes an extremely important tool in establishing when we can have the conversation how we can have the conversation and to what extent we should have the conversation with those that are beneficiaries from the income that we have. So budgeting then says, how much do we, do we earn? We need to identify the sources of income that we have um, or the, the sources of cash flows that we have and whether they are constant or they are once off. And once we've done that, then we can be able to say, how much is our expenditure? When we know how much we spend, we can be able to plug out uh, some, some, some loopholes, if I can put it that way, because we will know that we cannot spend. If we've identified that we earn, our earning capacity is 5,000, we surely cannot have expenditure of 6,000, because when is one, where is 1,000 going to come from? And if we have been in a situation where we have been spending blindly without knowing how much we are spending, then we are in a serious danger. So budgeting is extremely important. We need to know husband and wife, or even if it's just husband or wife alone, you need to get to a point where on a monthly basis, you know how much you make or you earn and how much goes to your tithe, how much goes to your bills, that is your utilities, electricity, water, how much goes to your rent, how much goes to your groceries, how much goes to your school fees and so forth. And you know the net position. But, but I'm thinking right now, and someone might be thinking about that in the audience. I hope someone is thinking about this. There are some things that you know, come from nowhere. 
there's a hailstorm in Manzini, a hailstorm in Baban, and it damages some of my property, equipment, vehicle, or there could be a funeral. How, how do I budget for a funeral? Absolutely. There are unforeseen circumstances in life that you can never budget for. But it is important that even as you do your budget, you also make an, a provision for those unforeseen circumstances because they call them a rainy day. There will come a day that you would not expect that things will go this way. It is out of those unforeseen circumstances that you can then say, in the event there's an the eventuality that I never planned for, I can be able to go on to this um, uh, uh, amount that we have allocated and you are then able to take care of them. But it should not be that your unforeseen become the bulk of your expenditure. Then you have a serious problem. Now coming to the funeral, you can certainly budget for a funeral. I think we are at an age or at an era where talking about the, the eventuality of one passing away must not be avoided because it is an eventuality. It is going to happen. It's a matter of when. It's not a matter of if. <laughs> In our African society, it becomes very difficult to talk about it, but we all know it is going to happen. Um, it's, it's just when, uh, but we know it is going to happen. So it becomes a crucial uh, conversation as well that must be held at some point and it, its outcome is then to say, so how do we then plan for a possibility of a funeral happening? There are funeral policies. There are insurance companies that sell funeral policies, some which uh, cost per month as little as uh, an amount equivalent to a loaf of bread. So you certainly can sacrifice a loaf of bread in a month to pay for a funeral insurance uh, premium, so uh, insurance premium uh, policy so that you can be taken, your loved one or yourself can be taken care of in dignity when you pass on. That's good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So Pastor Kate, a lot has been shared. Um, many principles have been shared and perspectives, but we are all Christians here. Yeah, yeah, amen. Amen. And I think we, we would all want to know what the word of God says about everything that has been shared. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Before we do that, I'd like to just share a financial tip that I received today. Um, so I have the determination that when I get home, I need to make a cup of tea for my wife. And as long as it's five roses tea, it's going to be good for Valentine's Day. So. <laughs> <laughs> So last week we, we were talking about um, what exactly would a concept like Ubuntu look like uh, from a biblical perspective. And there are passages in the Bible that says, honor your father and your mother. And, and sometimes the idea of honor is not limited to respect. It has to do with their well-being and making sure that you are taking care of them. Your immediate family is a responsibility and, and depending, you know, there's your immediate family and then there's also the extended family. The Bible does encourage us to have the attitude that if I see, and it doesn't even have to be a family member, if I see even my neighbor struggling and I have something to alleviate that struggling, then out of the goodness of my heart, I could go ahead, I should go ahead, help that person. The thing about that is the Bible also has a principle that does not encourage laziness. We've been reading in our Bible reading, we've been reading through the book of Proverbs. And it's amazing how many times in the book of Proverbs you, you get to realize that it's actually a sin to be a lazy person. Now, the way that the Apostle Paul dealt with the problem of laziness in Thessalonica was actually, it sounded to me the first time I looked at it, it sounded like it was extreme. Because he was saying, have nothing to do 
with idle people, that you ought to withdraw fellowship from people who are idle. And then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, he says, even when I was with you, we gave you this rule. If a man does not work, then neither shall he eat. God doesn't want us to be sitting back and enjoying the good life while other people have to work for that. And we're just sitting back as recipients. In fact, what we're ultimately doing is we are rewarding bad behavior. We need to be careful that as Christian people, we're not doing that, that we are actually empowering people because there's, there's a sense of dignity uh, that goes with being able to do things for yourself. Now, when it becomes debilitating, when it's outside of somebody's control, that's a whole different story. And we, as Christian people, need to recognize we have a responsibility to those people. But let's not be doing for people things that they could and should be doing for themselves. Here's another way in which this was um, explained in the Bible. And, and when I first read these passages, I was like, is this a contradiction or what? I was in Galatians chapter 6. When I was reading verse 2, it said, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Then I go down, and, and it's not even three verses later. In verse 5, it says, For each one should carry his own load. I'm like, I need to recognize there is a difference between a burden and a load. And the burden is what you are not able to carry yourself. And you do need help with that. But the load is the area of your own personal responsibility. And God doesn't want other people carrying your load. Okay? Your load is your load. You need to carry it. It becomes a burden when you cannot carry it. But let's not make that as an excuse or a reason to be drawing money away from other people. And so I think for this, for now, that's a good place to just rest at. There's, there's, there's balance between what you're supposed to do for yourself and what you need other people to help you with. And let's find the balance so that we can be happy people. Thank you so much. So um, in a few minutes, we're going to open the floor for questions, for you to ask questions. But before we get there, just want to get to the core of what we want to talk about tonight, which is crucial conversations. And I'm going to uh, come to you, Celeste, and um, ask the question, how, what practical steps can we take um, in having these family techs crucial conversations? Thank you so much, Bevan. Um, so I'm putting a disclaimer out before I speak. You may not like what I say, and that's okay. Um, I'm giving you what I feel is truth, what I feel works, right? So at the bottom of this, though, I want you to keep in mind, I'm speaking with regards also to identity. You need to be solid in your identity to be able to have crucial conversations. If you're struggling with insecurity or low self-esteem or fear or doubt or anxiety, this is going to be difficult, more difficult, because I think even if you are solid in your identity, it can cause offense, it can trigger people, it can hurt people, but it's being truthful, being authentic, and um, trying to deal with this so that in future there aren't any more serious problems. Um, I think being the person who is giving the tax, the person who's helping the other people, you've got to also keep in mind what family tax means, right? You've got a solid understanding for yourself. You can't just start talking because you'll talk from a point of, I just don't want to give. They just want. We've got to be cognizant of the fact of other people as well. I think it is noble that we care and kind-hearted and tender. We've heard about all of this in giving this conversation. And I, I really appreciate the fact that Pastor Bevan um, prayed early and said, please receive it with a heart of love. I was like, thank you. Anyway, so it's, I'm going to give a few um, pointers here. First and foremost, pray for God's wisdom and direction. And you may be wondering, why am I saying that? Because you're going to give me the tips for a crucial conversation. Yeah, but what you say in that crucial conversation will not be the same as what somebody else says. Because God has a, a message for you when it comes to your family tax situation. It may not be the same for me, right? Um, I was speaking earlier and I gave the example of um, Joyce Mayer. Joyce Mayer was abused by her father. 
But she looked after him. She built a house for him. She walked with him to the Lord. We would probably not expect that because why is she giving somebody who's hurt her? And it's her father, right? But God obviously spoke to her for that. He may not speak the same to all of us. And this is why I'm saying the first point is pray for God's wisdom and direction. And then the next point is be obedient to the direction. Let's not forget that one. I think often we'll say, we're going to pray, we're going to pray, I'm going to hear from God. And then, oops, God spoke, no, that's not what I want. So the next step is being obedient to Christ, right? And so now I'm just going to give you some steps that you can follow in doing this. Um, it's not rocket science. You're probably going to sit there and be like, oh, yeah, no, I thought of that before. Um, and that's great. Are you applying it is the question, right? So I'm giving information, but you've got to go and apply the information um, in your discussions around family tax. So firstly, it's important to prepare by thinking about your own goals and your own um, financial situation, including such things like unexpected expenses, right? That is part of your budget. It's part of your everyday living. Having a savings so that if things go wrong, you can cover. And your savings is not for family tax, Family tax, if you are going to be doing and engaging in that, is in your budget, right? So you need to go there very prepared. You know where you stand. You know how much you earn. You know your expenses. You've, you've completed your budget, your savings, where things are going. Be prepared because if you're not prepared, you're going to be caught off guard. And when you're caught off guard, you're not going to talk with conviction because you're ooing and eyeing, which then the message doesn't get across, okay? And so... Be very clear about that. Also, choose the right time and place for the conversation. I think we've heard this numerous times when it comes to com communication. And I'm not saying I always do these things. So when you see me not operating with crucial conversations, do not come to me and say, but Celeste, you said, I'm also on a journey, right? I have the tips and I'm trying to apply them. So choose the right time and place for these conversations. A place and a time when everyone's relaxed, you know, it's peaceful. Um, choose a private setting. Please don't go and sit in mug and bean and decide you're going to discuss family tax and you're probably going to have to pay the bill. Um, so be very cautious in that regard. Um, and make sure you can have an open, honest communication um, without interruption. So put the phones aside, put the radio off, put the TV off. We're showing as well that this is serious. Like, I'm not joking anymore. I'm having a serious, crucial conversation. Um, I know sometimes when things are going well in the family and everyone's happy and peaceful, we think, hey, this is going to cause problems and we become peacekeepers, right? Let's just keep the peace. Sometimes you've got to shake the boat for things to get sorted. And so those happy moments are probably the best moments because you're catching the person in their best space, right? So remember, be prepared Know your financial stand, know what you're going to say, know where you're at. Find the right time and place. Now, this is the part that is difficult um, for most people, including myself, is using I statements. Often when we talk or we want to confront people, or we want to address something or approach a situation, we say you. Straight away, that person's going to get ready to defend themselves, right? And so use I statements to express your thoughts and your feelings without placing blame. You don't want to lose the person you're talking to. You want to engage them. You want to keep them. You want them to hear you, not just listen. They must understand what you're saying, okay? So rather than saying, you're always asking me for money and never manage your money well, I mean, you can imagine if somebody said that to you, straight away you're going to get defensive, whether it's the truth or not, and you know it's the truth or not. You could rather say, I feel concerned about your financial situation. I feel concerned about your financial situation and would like to discuss how we can work together to address it, to share my limits with you, to share what I can do and what I cannot do to help you. You're keeping the energy low. You're keeping the emotions low. Remember, like I said earlier, money will bring emotional situations. It will bring thoughts. It will bring behaviors. So we want to keep the emotions peaceful. Use I statements. Avoid pointing that finger because you're, not, you're going to lose the person and that whole conversation is no longer going to be crucial. It's going to be useless. Okay, listen actively to the other person's perspective. So it's not just about you delivering information. Remember, we said it's a conversation. It's not giving information. So you need to listen to the other person, hear them out. Whether you, it's going to move you to change your mind or not, give them that space, give them the time of day to hear where they're at, what their thoughts are, what they think, how they feel. Um, it's important to create the space um, where somebody feels heard and understood. I think that's how we bring about healthy relationship, when somebody feels heard and they feel understood. The important thing here, people, is, and this is the important thing with communication, it's not just about listening and speaking. 
It's about understanding. Because I can com communicate to you in a way that I understand, but you may not get the same understanding. And that's the key I feel when it comes to communication. Give, let the person tell you what they're hearing you say. After you've given your information, did you hear what I said? Like, does it, do you understand? Maybe share with me what you heard so that you're both on the same page because you can be running down this way and the person's understanding down this way and already another situation where now it's a pointless um, communication, pointless conversation. You're not going to achieve your goal. So you focus on solutions together. I think we all know um, in relationship, when somebody wants to tell you what to do, well, I know for myself, when somebody wants to tell you what to do, uh, there's something that stands up in you, like, don't tell me what to do. Uh, think about if you go on a diet. You never really liked cake. Now you decide you're going on a diet, all of a sudden you want cake because you're not allowed it, right? I think it's human nature in some ways when there's a, a resistance or a no, we then want to push. And so it's very much the same if you're just dictating and not giving them a chance to talk and hearing their needs, what they want, where they're at, what their plans are to get out of the situation if they have any. So those are the things that we need to discuss. Once everyone has had a chance to share and all the stuff is on the table, this is the chance now for you to share your truth, to share how much, to who, when, and how long. It's not just, I will give you 500 Rand every month. Mom, I will give you 500 Rand on the 25th of December for the next six months. We will then come back and look at it. Making sense? Very clear, very direct. Can you just repeat that bit of the how, when, just for my sake? <laughs> so you will say how much, to who, when, and for how long, right? And so you're very clear in that. It's not just a generic I'll give you 500 rand because if you say a generic on the second mum will come and you may have money because you've just been paid on the 23rd when mum comes what are you going to say if you don't have the money but you said you're going to give me 500 rand every month you gave me last month why are you not giving me this month because you are not clear in your discussion you are not clear in what you can provide and in where you're at and so always keep in mind though that the reality of your financial situation is under the authority of God right? God, how much, who do I, don't I? You know, we, we can sometimes think we're helping people by giving them money, but we're not. Like we said, like we heard earlier, we're enabling bad behavior. We're enabling laziness. We are not being our brother's keeper. So it is important, is noble to help, but according to what God tells you to. So God may tell me to give a thousand rand and I'm earning maybe less than my sister. And he'll tell my sister to give 500 rand and she's earning a lot more than me. I need to submit to God. I can't be like, oh God, but my sister earns more than me, blah, blah, blah. No, God's told me what to do. And remember I said earlier, if you don't do things according to their natural purpose, which is what God created and said it must be, you're going to have mental health issues. It is a given, right? And so we then set that boundary. So you've shared the how, the who, the when, the how long. That's your boundary, we heard earlier about setting boundaries. That is your boundary. So, mom, don't come, come to me on the first because I only give you your money on the seventh. I'm not going to give it on the first, right? Because you've already assessed where you're at and what you can do. So set those boundaries very clearly. The next step with that, people, is you don't just set the boundary because I've, I've noticed this is what happens. People set the boundary and then they break their own boundary. So now you've set the boundary and then... The people who are coming for help are going to always try, right? They're going to default to their natural setting, which is to ask. So they're going to try and break that boundary. You need to maintain it. And that's when it gets a bit difficult because it's like, now I'm really being nasty. Like this person needs it. But you have already shared. It's for them then to decide how they're going to utilize the information you use. You may end up feeling guilty. And I spoke earlier, I was speaking um, with the gentleman here and saying, but again, it goes back to identity. If I'm solid in my identity and I know I have heard from Jesus and I know I'm being obedient to Christ, there's no reason for me to feel guilty. If I am feeling guilty, there's something else in me that needs to be addressed. Does this make sense? Right? Also, the person who, may, who you're speaking to who may get offended, and, and this is one way I need to really try and be gentle and kind and loving because I can be quite harsh and cutthroat. They must deal with it. They must deal with it, 
like I'm trying to be nice, but if they're offended with the truth, that is not your burden to carry. Does that make sense? They need to then deal with their forgive their unforgiveness. They need to take it to Jesus because you have done according to what God has told you to be, and you've been obedient. So you can't carry that from them. And that's where the issues may come out, where we see again mental health and family tax, because the person who's wanting to receive the money now starts throwing their toys. Does this make sense? They now get angry, they get offended, they get hurt. Understandably so. I'm not saying that they shouldn't get offended or shouldn't get upset. That's their situation in the moment. It's not yours to carry because you've tried, you've worked with them, you've come up with the plan um, and you're doing the best that you can. Um, so clearly define the boundaries with assertiveness. People, when you set a boundary, you can't say, um, so Bruce, you know, um, you know your mom and dad like um, need um, help. Uh, Bruce is not going to listen to me. I need to be assertive. Bruce, we've spoken about your mom and dad needing help, and this is what I think we need to share with them. Are you in agreement with that? But if I'm ooing and eyeing, I'm not speaking with conviction. I'm not going to be heard. Does this make sense? So set the boundary with assertiveness. Share your boundary with love. Your when, your how, your who, your how long. Maintain them. And you be a person of your word as well. So it's not only the other person, we've got a role to play as the person giving, right? You've also got to model healthy behavior to that person. When that person then sees you going to ask other people for money, ah, oh, you've lost the plot now because you're doing exactly what they're doing, but you're coming against and coming down on them. Does this make sense? So accept the reaction of your loved one and remember that some burdens are not yours to carry. Some burden is for the other person to carry. God may be working in their heart and you're interfering. Right, And this is why we've got to submit it to Christ. After you've established that, and that's probably the crux of the discussion, um, where the emotions start rising, you try to keep your cool and calm at all times so that you can try and keep the atmosphere peaceful. Then I think it's really important to try and educate, equip, and share financial literacy nuggets with your family. Right? So I got here because I did A, B, C, and D. I know how much I can give you because I have a budget. And they may say to you, I don't even have a budget. No, you do. I've just given you 50 rand. How are you going to use that money? Does this make sense? Right? And so we're not just giving and enabling them to rely and be dependent on us. We are now doing the extra bit of showing awareness, educating, equipping, um, empowering them, again, according to where they're at. And I think one of the things that I, I really want to share, you know, because money is... It's something we don't really talk about. It carries a lot of emotion, whether you've got a lot or a little, right? I think you'd agree with me that money brings emotion. And so if it brings emotion, uh, it means that it's, it's going to impact your thoughts, it's going to impact your behaviors. Are you with me? So recently, there's been a new field that's come out to try and address the situation. And it's, um, it's called money coaching, not financial debt management, not accounting, not the science of money, but the social science of money, if that makes sense. It looks at the psychology, neuroeconomics and spirituality around money. So it's not separating them, because I think for many years it's been if you're in debt, you go to a financial advisor, right? Um, if you're struggling, you go to the church. Generally, we need prayer. Help me. If you're, um, if you, if you can't get a job or you're depressed, you'll go to the psychologist or the counselor. And so this is now the money coaching that's come out is combined all three, um, so that we can then deal with the situation. Worst case scenario, you could then say, you know what, I'm going to send you to a money coach if the person doesn't want to hear from you. Because remember, our family don't always want to learn from us. They will sometimes hear stuff from outsiders better than what they'll hear from us. And then if that's what you're going to do to empower them, equip them, and educate them, put it in your budget. Does that make sense? So for me, in a nutshell, that is how you'd have a crucial conversation. Please hear me. I'm not saying this is going to be easy. It is difficult. And um, I'll share um, in with all due respect to my mom who's passed away, and I share this to, to also honor her. My mom was very sick with cancer, and she, my father had passed away, and my mother decided she was gonna have a new partner, right? Much to my um, dislike, but anyway, that's besides the point. But this partner decided that he was only with my mother for her money. Remember, she's a widow. He knew she was a widow, and he assumed she'd had an inheritance because my father was a businessman. And he started using all my mother's money. 
my husband and I was, we had just recently been married, trying to create our own lives. Um, and I looked at this and I thought, this is going to go pear-shaped very quickly because my mother's not working. We trying, how are we going to do, like that family tax story is going to be a problem. And so I went for counsel. And after counsel, I wrote a letter to my mother and I said to her, and please don't frown at me and judge me. It was in love. I said to her, mum, I know that you're sick. I love you. I appreciate you. I, I want the best for you. I, I want to help you and I want to be there for you. However, if you continue to support this man and you continue to use your money for your livelihood while you're sick with cancer and need treatment to give this man money, I will not be able to look after you when your money is finished. That was the most difficult thing for me to do. I loved my mom. I didn't have a conflictual relationship to make it like, yeah, I'll show you. But I had to do that because I knew that if my mother needed treatment and cancer treatment was expensive, I was not going to be able to help her. And she was very offended with me. But praise God, we made peace. Um, and God obviously intervened somehow that we were able to stop the money transfer. She didn't listen to me, though. Um, but that's the example I'm giving you. I... I've walked that journey. I felt really bad and really guilty. It was difficult, but I had the crucial conversation. And my crucial conversation was not to help because I knew I wouldn't be able to. I had thought of my financial situation. I've thought about what I had, what I didn't have, how long, who, when. Uh, there was nothing. Does this make sense? And so I just wanted to share that with you to give um, some background or an example to what it means to have a crucial conversation. That's good. Thanks for sharing, Celeste. So now we'd like to um, open the floor for questions. If you've got a question, please just lift your hand and Tawa is going to come through with the mic. I see a question right in front here. So what we're going to ask for everybody who's asking questions is that um, please try to ask your question within 30 seconds. Um, because you're asking the question, not really giving the background and, you know, every other detail to customize it. Um, just ask the question. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And thanks so much for the panel. I couldn't be here last week, so I'm glad there was a sort of, uh, um, um, you know, feedback from the last week. Please don't count that as part of my 30 seconds. <laughs> Uh, um, 20 now. But, 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 but um, very quickly, three things. Um, um, thank you so much for the, 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 the psychological and emotional part of it. Um, a lot of us were raised in complicated families. And I think one of the things I struggle with um, is um, being expected to do this family tax when I feel that I have a lot of emotional um, scars and trauma, especially so uh, um, when demands are being made. Um, the second thing I want to ask is, what is family? Um, my part of Africa that I come from, West Africa, there's no word for cousin, and I'm sure it's quite similar here. Um, all of your first cousins are essentially your brothers and sisters. And fortunately or unfortunately for me, I had one grandfather who was a polygamist and the other one who was not quite a polygamist. I mean, not quite a monogamist, if you know what I mean. Married to one woman, but well. <laughs> so I have a whole bunch of cousins. Uh, uh, um, and, and, and from a biblical perspective, how do you treat this concept of, of family, which is African, which is our reality? Lastly, and I don't know if this is a question or more of a comment, um, and I thank you for the tips in budgeting um, and for rainy day, but I think as Africans also, we don't talk a lot about investment because each money you give to family tax is less less money you can invest and to grow wealth. There are so many people that are not giving an inheritance to their children. And there are biblical verses about leaving an inheritance for your children. It's because we are prone to this family tax. Thank you. Thank you very much. So likewise, I'm going to ask the panel as well to just ask, answer this um, briefly within a minute or a minute and a half. Um, please forgive me. I'm going to take one of your questions and present it to the panel. 
right? Um, and in the process, if you've got a question already, you, you can just raise your hand, Kawa will come to you, so that, um, that as we are answering this question, you'll be ready to give you the mic. So, Pastor Ket, I'm going to give it to you to define what is family. So that's the question I'm picking up from what she had asked. That is a very difficult question to, to answer. I'm not sure that I have the answer because we, our family is really, really big. I think our primary responsibility is to immediate family. Okay, and sometimes you get to just have that conversation to say, I only have so much, it cannot go as widely as you would like me to send it. And so this is what I can do. And I'm really sorry that I cannot do more than that. It's based on my budget and the relationships and the closeness of the relationships aren't as important as your ability. The important thing that we're saying here is don't put yourself into financial debt that's going to cause you physical stress that you can't carry. Um, just help the family or the cousin to understand your limitation and that's part of the boundaries that you need to be put in place. I hope that helps. Thank you, Pastor Kat. Sisa, would you want to add to that? Just in a, under a minute. Right, you asked three questions there. The first one was a question which um, dealt with heart issues, which I think is only on a totally different platform. Yes, it's interlinked, but it wouldn't be fair for us to go into to that tonight. Um, obviously, the family, it's, it's been very clear that your family is your own children. To include family, which is true, they are family, the descendants of your grandfather was polygamous, which in my case is 200 odd grandchildren. It's a lot, you know, it's a lot to ask of me. So keep your family small. The ones that you, your family, use the scientific approach. A family is normally consisting of two adults and their offspring with a common residence. That's family for you. <laughs> <laughs> your, your last question was um, an issue of how do we um, take care of our finances? I think Celeste touched on that when she covered um, financial coaches, go that route. Because if we say, well, that's not really family tax. Now, when you're taking your money and putting it somewhere, you know, we're, we're gonna deal with when you take your money and give it to family, extended family in this case, okay. I hope it answers you, yeah, I know it didn't, but I hope it does. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, all right. It was a lovely comment then. Thank you so much. Anyone with a question? Please just raise your hand and Tawe can come to you. Yes, we've got a question here in front, Tawe. Anyone else with a question, please raise your hand because we can actually take about three questions right now um, and then answer all of them at once. Okay. All right, thank you. I will not ex extend, I'll just th go straight to the question. Uh, my question is how do we balance, okay, maybe it's just a play of words, between the tech, family tax and family responsibilities in terms of the basic needs, maybe it's health needs or food that they can't really um, take care of themselves versus the situation where I would say the tax where they just wanna go spoil themselves, my son is now working, I need to give me some, you need to give me something. So how do you then balance up to say, in the question A, like the needs, um, they need money for, let, let me use this example of cancer treatment, but I want to take my family out for a trip overseas. And then how do I then balance, do I take the money and neglect going to overseas versus to what the family needs? Because I'm the only one who, who can actually meet the, their needs. How do I balance uh, that up? All right, thank you for asking. Kawe, we've got someone with their hand up this in front.
Okay, mine was in the question, but um, what I wanted to just highlight also was uh, some of us come from a country where your savings have been eroded by the decisions the government you have chosen have made. Um, and that makes it a very difficult situation if you are a Zimbabwean to try to balance between family tax and when I become a blessing to my parents. So when I'm thinking about the situation we're talking about, I love what Celeste said about crucial conversations. Um, if I'm going to give an example, my parents-in-law had about 80 cows, eight zero cows, um, but we would be sending money monthly. If, even if there's a small project, they would say, may you give us the money? And then the other time my husband decided to have a crucial conversation and said, but dad, do you know you can sell two cows to cover this project? I actually felt guilty. I'm like, but how dare you say to, to them, sell your cows? It's like, you know, um, but when, you know, what he was trying to do was to show them that they've got resources they can actually utilize. I remember they didn't listen like Celeste, you were saying. Then they came this, uh, what is foot and mouth? And it killed about 30. And my mother-in-law had almost a heart attack because really 30 beasts, you could have sold them and built something very beautiful. So what I'm trying to acknowledge and, and say thank you for this conversation is uh, clarifying that you can hear from God and having the ability to take crucial conversations out of love. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't really look at what we send our parents as texts to me personally, uh, because I also believe with my Christian maturity that I'm, I'm supposed to honor my parents and bless them. But when times and demands are coming, I also need to know my boundaries. And we have experienced both. So is that true? Yeah, and remain a cheerful giver. And remain a cheerful giver. <laughs> Thank you. You still have your hand up? OK. Um, thank you for the pointers on having crucial discussions. My question is, how do you um, decompress? Because usually you don't have these crucial discussions in a nice place. They just sort of like implode. You know, you're just at your wits end and you're just like, I'm done. And then you have these discussions and then you say things that you'll regret. So... Um, I just wanted to just get some practical skills on how can you, when you see that the situation has, you know, gone far and you're already in that heated discussion, how can you decompress and get back to have a more productive conversation? All right. Thank you for asking. Um, can we answer that first and then come to your question about balancing responsibilities and tax? So Celeste, can you answer that question, the last one? Thank you so much for the question um, and a very important question because I think often we only then want to have the crucial conversation because we've had enough, right? And that is why it's so important, I think, that we're having this for people who are not experiencing that yet to avoid getting to that point. So... Remembering, though, your buildup of emotion or frustration, your trigger points are your trigger points, right? And so you're responsible for that um, in that conversation. They cannot be responsible for triggering you. So that's the first thing. The second thing is spend time for yourself reflecting on why am I triggered? Why am I feeling so angry? What is it that they say to me? Because there's many reasons why you get angry. One, you're finishing my finances. Two, you're taking advantage of me. Three, why aren't you doing it for yourself? There's many things that could be going on and you've got to figure that out for yourself, okay? If you need to speak to somebody to get perspective, somebody who you, who's wise and who you trust, um, then do that because sometimes we have blind spots ourselves, right? And so you may find that you're triggered because you've got a fear of lack, it's got nothing to do with that person. That's your fear. That's your stuff that you need to deal with. So I hear what you're saying about, okay, now I'm worked up. I'm already angry. You know that. So now you need to deal with that before you have that conversation. Does that make sense? 
So you're already aware enough to know, you know what, if we have this conversation, I'm going to lose my mind here. I'm going to really lose it. Then you need to think, okay, what am I going to do to calm myself down? So number one, remember I said, time and place make a difference. If you're having this conversation at home, you're going to blow up. It's almost a guarantee. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying um, go and hire out a meeting room, right? But at home, we... We put our worst foot forward. That's the reality. If it means you've got to get a mediator to help you, who's familiar, who's aware, who has insight into the stuff, then do it. Because that person's going to keep the cool for you, if that makes sense. But I think at the end of the day, it's recognizing why am I so worked up and addressing that. So I'll, in my situation, I was worked up for two reasons with my mother. One, you with this man that's taking your money after my father's passed away and worked so hard to look after us. That was my stuff. That's got nothing to do with my mother. That's my stuff, right? And two, my fear of if your money gets finished, how on earth am I going to help you survive? That's my stuff. Does that make sense? I had to go and deal with that, even though she was triggering it through her behavior and expectation of me. I hope that answers you. Right, so for, thank you so much, Celeste. Second question, the question that was asked, um, I'm going to give it to Mzingai to speak into that. How do we balance family tax versus family responsibilities? Thank you. Um, so I think, as has been said earlier on, it's important to identify what is a need and what is a want. Um, and in the context the question was asked, I think there are needs and there are wants. And as the son or as um, the person who provides help to, is it your parents or whoever, the starting point is to know how much you earn or what your income is and know how much you can spend um, and whether or not you remain with any excess. Because if you don't speak to the current reality in terms of what your income makeup is, you are almost certainly going to spend what you don't have. And whether it's a need or a want, you want to first know how much you earn and how much you can spend. Then you can begin to enter into a discussion of saying, can I be able to take care of their needs? If so, how much can I take care of their needs? Because their needs, if it's a sickness and whatsoever, it also speaks to where can they best be taken care of? the facilities, be it um, private facilities, be it government facilities and so forth, also not compromising on the quality of the health care that they can get. But you can only get to, those, um, to that aspect by identifying how much you can spend. Because you don't want to make a commitment and say, you are sick, I'm going to take you to Mill Park Hospital and you cannot be able to take care of that bill. When the bill comes, you will be driven into debt and you are not able to service it. So it's important to brings us back to saying, how much can I have as an excess? As for the ones, certainly, I think, again, the starting point is, what is your core family? What are your goals? Where are you headed? You don't want to be an irresponsible um, parent or parents because you are taking care of the external family members at the expense of your very own. You need to identify and say, what are our goals? Where am I taking my, my family to um, before I can begin to say, where am I taking uh, Pastor Bevin's family to? Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Msingai. Anyone else with, um, with a question? Okay, we've got a question right there. Uh, good evening. Um, my question comes after you have done what Celeste said. Um, usually with our African society, there's isolation that comes afterwards. You have set your boundaries, you have told them what you want, what you're expecting. Then afterwards, you're isolated from family or even phone calls sometimes. I don't know if it makes sense, <laughs> but um, how do you do? I understand you said my family my, my husband, my kids are my family, but sometimes you need that extended family. So when you set those boundaries, sometimes there's an isolation that can happen. So how do you deal with such a situation? 
Okay, thank you for that question. So th there's something that Celeste mentioned earlier. Um, I'm going to give it to you, Celeste, because I think there's something you mentioned earlier which can answer the question that has been asked. Um, if I am thinking like you are, it's a self-identity. If you're solid in your identity in Christ, you know you're going to be persecuted. You know that people are going to turn against you. You know you're going to have those struggles. And not that we're saying that we just do it because we know. That's not what I'm saying. But if I know I've been obedient to God, I know I'm living in my true identity as a child of God, doing what he's told me to do um, in love, um, being consistent, considerate, and I'm, I'm trying my best to be faithful and obey, I will go back to God to deal with my isolation. Isolation is painful, I understand. Um, but if you're not going to do it, I can almost guarantee you'll still have isolation anyway. When you're giving more than you can or where you don't want, you're going to build resentment. And that's what the boundaries are for. They're to save those relationships. They're to save you. They're a guide. They're a God. Um, we often don't set boundaries because of that fear. We think, oh my gosh, they won't like me. They'll isolate me. They'll cut me off. Chances are they'll probably respect you a lot more, even if it's eventually, because that's the role of a boundary. And so your, your fear that you're trying to avoid um, by not necessarily having that crucial conversation because of fear of isolation is probably going to come to pass anyway because you're going to be so resentful, so angry. You're going to be in a situation. You're going to probably then isolate them. And so at the end of the day, I feel that if your identity is solid in Christ, you know who you are. You know why you're doing what you're doing. I'm not being selfish. I'm not being vindictive. You will maybe still feel guilt, but you'll recognize that, you know what, this is the healthiest thing I can do. I'm doing the best that I can. Um, and then it's trying to manage with those feelings of isolation. And in that situation, take it to Jesus because he'll, he'll heal you. And, and can I also ask that we look down the road? Okay, I'm here at this point and I'm paying out more than I'm getting in. If I don't say now, I can't afford it. There's going to come a time where my bank manager is going to take my house and my car and my job away from me. And then I'm still going to come to the same people and say, okay, now I can't afford it. Except now I'm worse off now than I was back then. And the isolation, if it's going to be there, is still going to be there. So look down the road and, and, and recognize that some of these roads we actually cannot afford to go down. Right. Thank you, Pastor Kate. Thank you, Celeste. I've got one question that was, um, I, well, actually, I have two questions, but the other one, I feel that it has already been answered. There's one question that was submitted last week, which reads, while the Bible is very clear about responsibilities of children to elderly parents, how does one set boundaries for siblings who are leeching off the money or groceries that you send to your parents? <laughs> It looks like this question was written by many people in this room. <laughs> Sfiso, can you speak into that? <laughs> it's one of those questions, Pastor Bev, which um, you really don't want to answer because the person will turn around tomorrow and say, oh, but you said, you know, so we'll just dilly-dally around the question. <laughs> And not answer it. Look, you know um, what you provide for your extended family. Even though you're not keeping a proper budget, but you know your responsibility towards them. If you've got siblings who are busy making babies and then taking the babies to be raised up by the parents, you have a serious problem. If you are going to now look into the budgeting and the, the supplies that you've supplied to your parents and watch them get depleted and you know what the problem is, and then you try to fix that. That's not the problem. The problem is your siblings who are busy making children they can't afford to look after. So the crucial conversation might start with your siblings and not necessarily. The, the worst thing that we try to do, we get guilt tripped into spending more. You know those type of things, you get them and you go, hang on a minute, but did I not just send money the other day? I mean, how much more can you give? So the crucial conversation has to be had, first with the siblings. Take the format that Celeste has, has given you tonight and apply it to your siblings as well. And say, stop making babies. They're lovely. 
They're a blessing from God, but you're just blessing this family too much. Stop it with the blessings. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Sfi. So th that wasn't dilly darling around. <laughs> so I'm just going to take the last question. And I saw a hand at the back. There was a hand at the back. I know there are many more hands, but... Is I've already got the mic. Oh, great. You can go ahead. I guess it's not the last question. <laughs> Let this be the last one then. <laughs> okay. So from what I've been hearing from last week, that this is something that came out many years ago, which worked. And it worked for communities and families. Then I hear it started getting manipulated and people started trying to tweak the system. Looking at our panel here right now, can I truthfully say that family tax is done in the next 20 years? No. So you're going to continue with it from what you're telling me. We need to draw the line here from what I see because our parents have they grown up and we are supporting them through this tax. We are sitting here complaining about it or sharing about it. So are we going to stop it and go back to what the Bible says and then we do things, we bless from our hearts. We don't pay a tax. Okay. I, I do want to say one of the things that we're trying to do is to get to a place where that's not the problem. And there may be some, some mindsets that need to change and the conversations start changing those mindsets. So we don't see children anymore as a social security project. I'm going to have a whole lot of children so that when I'm old, they will keep me in positive cash flow. I need, to be, I need to do family planning and recognize how expensive it is to send a child to school. And then I need to look at how much I'm earning and, and ask myself how many children I'm going to have. And so there's this mindset changes in a lot of different areas that need to happen in order for this problem to ultimately come to an end. All right. Thank you so much, Pastor Kate. So I'm seeing um, our time is, is off and um, I'm, I'm going to just pose one last question to Celeste as we're rounding up. And um, this is in line with um, looking into transactional relationships. As we're just rounding up, Celeste, how can, how can we handle those kind of relationships? Thank you. Um, so transactional relationships, if I'm understanding, is the people pleasing, the approval addiction, the manipulation, all that other stuff. Um, so I think at the end of the day, the key word for two key words for me when it comes to this topic is God and boundaries. Right. And obviously, if we're saying God, we're saying love. But at the end of the day, it goes back to who am I and who's am I? Right? I'm, I'm here because God's put me on this earth. He's my father. He directs my life. He guides, well, I'm hoping he does. Um, he guides me. He directs me. Those transactional um, relationships, reality is eventually they're going to go south if they're not addressed. And if we're not applying with the stuff we've heard today or taking heed of what we've heard to be aware, to have insight, to be vigilant, to be intentional, they will just continue, but on another level. So whereas before I'm coming to you and I'm saying, um, Bevan, I, I need 50 Rand because my mom's sick. And I'm being direct, but now you've set the boundary. I may then come with a, you know what, if you loved me, if you cared about me as your sister, you'll help me. I'm now manipulating you, but it's the same thing that I did before. Just now I've taken it another level, right? And it goes back, people, I, I, I can't say this enough, to your identity. The issue we are struggling with holistically is identity, right? And so if you know who you are, you know whose you are, you know what the money's for, whose the money's is, you're going to do things the right way, hopefully, or you're going to try to. Does this make sense? And those transactional relationships will hopefully eventually fade while you've modeled to the other partner healthy behavior. You've modeled healthy ways of living, healthy ways of relating, healthy ways of dealing with your money. 
um, dealing with your family. Because yes, we agree that this family tax can be burdensome, but we mustn't forget that we still need to be noble in helping and playing our part for our family, like we heard earlier. So when you know who you are in Christ, number one, you'll deal with your guilt. You'll deal with your isolation. The wounds that you speak of, God will heal those. I will give as I can and I'll be peaceful about it. I will learn how to be a peacemaker rather than a peacekeeper because I know who I am and whose I am. I've got an instruction manual to tell me what to do, which is the Bible. And so at the end of the day, when I think of family tax or I think of black tax or money, because that's what comes to my mind. For me, the answer straight away is God love boundaries, identity. No more transactions. I hope that answers. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Sviso, in a minute, any last words? So black tax or family tax has got many faces and we all agree we are affected by one of those faces. Um, I love your question, Bruce, to say, what are we going to do about it? The best we can do is to manage it. We, we can't do away with it because these are mindsets. We will manage it in the godly manner which we expected to do it so that it doesn't affect us negatively. Uh, they, we still have a responsibility to our family to support our family. Last week, there was a verse which Pastor Kurt went over and said, um, a person who doesn't look after their family is worse off than an unbeliever. Uh, for the full citation, you'll have to go to Pastor Kurt. Um, <laughs> Uh, don't let uh, culture be used against you because it is done to you a lot. The culture that they used to you, that Ubuntu culture, was actually a two-way street. And everybody had a role to play. It was transparent. People knew what to do. Nowadays, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And they turn around and make you pay for their mistakes, forgetting that Ubuntu itself had the punishment of sorts when you didn't conform. And as I was thinking of the question that was asked about parents looking after parents, as a Bible verse that I came across earlier, I shared it with Celeste, but Celeste has forgotten it. Um, I love how I do the blame game. <laughs> but we'll go to Pastor Kurt for it, because in 2 Corinthians, I think, chapter 5, uh, I think verse 20, I'm not too sure, but the Apostle Paul was uh, coming to visit the church in Corinth, and he said to them, I'm coming to see you, but I'm not after your finances. And then he concludes that verse by saying, because parents, a child should not look after their parents, but rather parents should make provision for their children. Now, this is what was done in the Ubuntu culture. Those cows that uh, you were talking about, those 80 cows were actually there to look after you guys and not the other way around. That is the African culture of doing things. So don't let culture be used against you. What they're doing today is totally wrong. God bless you. Thank you, sister. Sengai, <laughs> in a minute, last words. Thank you, um, Pastor Bev. So you can only do so much because you earn so much. And you can only be stretched so much. There comes a point beyond which you can't stretch any longer. And that point must be established. And you can only establish that point by sitting down to craft your budget, identify your sources of income, ident identify the areas where you are spending your money on, and be very truthful to yourself. Don't fall into the, um, the trap of saying, I don't earn so much, so I don't have to budget. Even if you earn one Lilangen budget for it, know how you are going to spend it because it becomes extremely important uh, when you have these externalities that you've got to deal with. Um, otherwise, you will live in silent frustration, and it's not good as a believer to live in silent frustration or be coerced into giving, and then when you do so, you are not giving uh, cheerfully, you are giving grudgingly, and I don't believe there is a blessing in giving grudgingly. Thank you. Briefly, because we are out of time, the one area that we, I was hoping that we talk about that we didn't speak about was what happens in the family when there isn't agreement between husband and wife as to whether or not we're going to help extended family and the wife is now taking money behind the husband's back or the husband taking money behind the wife's back and supporting family and you, you have a serious possibility of the breakdown of the marriage. 
again, it's one of those areas where we've got to submit what we're doing to God. And we've got to, we've got to go with what God is saying that we should do in a given situation. But that's just an aside. There's a passage I want us to end with where it comes to having balance and equilibrium. And this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. It says this, For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that they might be equality. And so God is asking us to have boundaries, to have balance, and not to try to do beyond what we're able to do because we will break if we try that. Thank you, Thank you Pastor Kate. Can we give the panel a round of applause? Thank you so much.